France 24 and UNESCO present Welcome to what is one of the most beautiful sites on the planet. We're at Carthage here in Tunisia. And in the first programme in this series, we looked at the site here and heritage in general and how to preserve it for future generations. In this edition, we're going to look at a subject uh, which is very passionate for the people of Tunisia, that of freedom of expression and freedom of the press. So uh, stay with us for this special programme in conjunction with UNESCO. Now, let's not forget, of course, that Tunisia has come through a dramatic 10 years from the Arab Spring 10 years ago when they deposed uh, President Ben Ali, the dictator of 23 years. So we are here in uh, Tunisia at Carthage on the northern African coast. I'd like to take you now to uh, meet my guests on the programme today. And with us is uh, Emna Mizouni, who's a human rights activist, a press and internet freedom activist and co-founder of Digital Citizenship, which works on gender issues and helping young people as well. Uh, Nidal Gariani is a cartoonist well known for his uh, humorous and sarcastic cartoons on the Tunisian way of life. We'll look at uh, some of his cartoons a little bit later on in the programme. And uh, Rebeb Aloui, who's a journalist here in Tunisia. She's a radio host and she worked in social media as well. Thanks very much to all of you for coming in and talking to us today. So let's talk first then about human rights. Uh, Em, I mean, how tough it was, uh, was it for people like yourself and people who work with you uh, under the regime of Ben Ali to be able to, to even think about human rights, really? So, um... First of all, I would say that some people like myself, we're very blessed with the revolution because we found our voices. Um, we found ourselves after the uprising in 2011. Uh, but before it was so tough to live in a dictatorship where you cannot say anything, you cannot trust anyone, um, not, sometimes not even your ankles or aunts. Um, you would you cannot really talk about what's happening in the country, even if you know some things. Um, you would listen to uh, songs um, discreetly. Uh, in secrecy, everything was happening. A few people, they were um, blogging and blogging anonymously, uh, using different names, uh, trying to use also social media. At the time, Facebook um, was a tool to... Um, circulate what was happening basically in the country yet yeah, we found few um like i recall um not able to find few uh uh, accounts on social media, basically. But few of them, other people like Lina Ben Mhenni, um, was able to use her image, her face, her name, real name. But she was targeted by the Ben Ali police wherever she went. Um, and it was not easy. Uh, it was not easy for human rights defenders. We've seen a lot of cases of torture. And I think um, with, um, with a lot of series of videos released by the instance of truth and dignity, we've seen how people suffered under Ben Ali when they spoke out or even not speaking in public or using media but speaking even in classrooms it was not easy. Nidal let's uh, ask you about uh, you're a cartoonist I mean was it possible to, to, to even draw the kind of cartoons that you wanted to draw under Ben Ali? Uh, of course this was not imaginable and it was like I mean uh, 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 scaring situation for not yourself but even your family due to what happened around us to the censorship i mean the idea about speaking freely or exchanging ideas with your friends was like i mean a kind of uh, risk taken and uh, we were like not that trusting people around us if i would like just to add one more thing about the 2011 is after that we start trusting ourselves speaking publicly because before that you, we were suspecting anyone around us, even the closest friend, that might like just not uh, agree with our ideas and we might be reported. So I think this is something we gained. And I agree totally about the 2011 opened our eyes to freedom of expression. So it's like probably now we have four senses enabled. We still work on a fifth one just to listen to each other. So things will change and keep changing and um, we need to be patient and that's it. And Rabeb, uh, obviously freedom of expression that comes from freedom of the press as well. I mean, for journalists, it must have been incredibly difficult trying to work uh, under that kind of atmosphere. 
Yes, of course. The revolution really changed my life as a journalist. Uh, before, uh, we used to be afraid even to talk uh, on the phone about the, the regime. Uh, every uh, publisher need to pass by the uh, interior ministry before uh, publishing articles or everything. So everything was controlled by the Ministry of Interior. And also, we used to have a code of, uh, of a press of uh, 1975. This code was a tool for the regime to protect the regime, not the journalist. I will give you an example for, for this uh, code. We, uh, they put it some uh, fines and uh, imprison, uh, imprisonment uh, uh, rules in order to, uh, to judge journalists and to imprison them for, for, uh, for expressing themselves uh, uh, freely. So for me, I'm very proud of this revolution. It really changed my life uh, from uh, from right to left, from side to side. So yeah. uh, I think this is a big turnout for me. And can you write and publish whatever you want now? Now, yes. And I'm proud to say that I can pub publish, I can express myself, I can speak out uh, freely, uh, fortunately, mm. due to the revolution. And Nidal, you can draw whatever you want? Theoretically, yes. But I mean, uh, unfortunately, we discovered other type of censorship nowadays. Uh, the political censorship was easy to, uh, to just define. And behind that censorship, there was plenty of other just waiting in the queue. I mean, nowadays we have the social censorship, we have the religion censorship, we have the legacy censorship. And uh, after all we've done so far, the fight is just beginning. So I think we are still have a long road Till we see a freedom of expression around this area. And not only in this area, I mean, the other side of the Mediterranean Sea as well is suffering of this type of censorship. There is like even the economical censorship. So, Emily, would you agree with that, that uh, you know, Tunisia has come a long way, but there's still a lot further to go? Absolutely. We're, we're far behind. Ten years in the, in the age of a nation is nothing, basically. And if we take the achievement, yes, we uh, achieved freedom of expression, freedom of internet, but we are coming to a point after 10 years where we see censorship, as Nidal said, social censorship, uh, self-censorship. People, they are afraid of expressing themselves. Mm. And also with the political fatigue, it adds more to that censorship. Um, and also we've seen cases, um, although we moved a lot uh, from the dictatorship, we've seen cases of arrest, mm. open uh, freedom of expression. People expressing themselves on Facebook posts, blogging, videos. Um, they are censored. Some media, with if we go to what the journalist union released in their report, yes, there are cases of media censorship or attacks against media. We're not in the very pinky word yet, uh, but we're working towards that. Yeah, Rabbit, there was a, a warning, hasn't there been, from the uh, journalists without borders saying that the extreme right is starting to hassle journalists um, once again. It, it, uh, Tunisia's even uh, dropped just one place, yes. but dropped a place, hasn't it, in the World Freedom Index recently. Yes. I mean, it, is that, are there worrying signs, do you think? Um, let's say that we've done a big step in freedom of press and freedom of expression, and I agree with Nidal and Emna, there is a long way uh, to go. We have to keep a vigilant eye, let's say uh, now so but comparing with the regime of uh, Ben Ali's from uh, 2002 until 2010 uh, the rank of uh, Tunisia in freedom of press kept uh, dropping uh, I think it uh, it was in 2010 for example 164 today it's 73 mm. it's better but there is a long way to do but uh, I would like to mention one thing today journalists are not for example suffering from uh, police uh, repression well, there is cases, yes, but not like uh, before. But I would like to mention that the fact that uh, the, the, the hardest issue that we, journalists are suffering today in Tunisia is the, uh, the economic threatens. Uh, I'm not talking uh, just about the exploitative treatment of a journalist, uh, but uh, also the use of uh, businessmen. They are um, controlling uh, the media today, you know, Media needs advertisement, advertisement is business. So businessmen are trying to collaborate po with politics and everything. So it's all related, politics, business, 
and media. Unfortunately, we don't really have an independent media today in Tunisia because we are facing an economic crisis. So mostly the media are looking for advertisement, are looking for businessmen to, uh, to help to finance, uh, finance them. So yeah. let's say the, the, the threat today is an economic threat more than ever. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit more about that now, in fact, because it is very true that since the revolution of uh, 2011, it really did usher in that um, really new era of freedom for the people of Tunisia and for journalists as well. Private media has exploded, which has left a, a problem for uh, the public media here. Let's find out a little bit more in this report from uh, Seyfala Marshat with Andrew Hillier. It's one of the rare success stories in a troubled media landscape. IFM Radio is Tunisia's newest private radio station, but it already has a huge audience, ten times bigger than its nearest public rival. More listeners, perhaps, but for media specialists, private media outlets are as vulnerable to outside interference as their public counterparts, meaning that they can't be fully independent. But as more Tunisians turn to private networks, audiences for public stations have taken a nosedive, forcing insiders to consider where it all went wrong. Tunisia's public radio and television networks are riddled with structural problems. That prevents them from taking on their private counterparts, which have a clearer vision of the future and have streamlined the decision-making process. Ten years ago, the Tunisian revolution shook the media landscape free from the stranglehold of state security services and political decision making. But despite that, state media outlets remain weighed down by bureaucracy and out of touch with ordinary Tunisians. So, Rabat, then you've actually presented uh, for IFM. I mean, do you see it as a, a problem at all that the private media is, is, is coming up uh, so strongly? You were mentioning uh, the problem of who uh, individual private media is owned by. Uh, I found it uh, good and a bit thing at the same time. It's good to see this diversity, this pluralism of media. But at the same time, this diversity doesn't uh, guarantee uh, independence of the media. That's what, what we need as a journalist today in Tunisia. We need really to be independent from businessmen, from politicians, etc. So I worked for EFM. It was a, a great experience because uh, we, we used to have freedom of speech. We, we can uh, express ourselves uh, freely. Really. At the same time, we worked a lot on uh, social uh, media, so I found it a good thing. At the same time, a bad thing because of the businessmen who are controlling the media to exert leverage on uh, political scene. And now, do you think that's something that we should be uh, worried about, people in Tunisia, who controls the media? Of course, yeah. I mean, uh, that's, I mean, probably an issue worldwide. Who's controlling the media? I mean, we know that plenty of businessmen are controlling the majority of the media around the world. And uh, we are copying, the, unfortunately, the bad experiences outside in democratic areas. So we are doing the same errors and we try to take advantage of that. I'm not talking about journalists. I'm not talking about uh, the lower classes or medium classes. I'm talking about the intelligentsia, about the businessmen. They are looking at replicating uh, defective solutions existing outside. Mm. Nowadays, it's going to take some time before we see emerging solutions from social media or new generation medias. And even though they are still keeping eyes on that, there is a lot of control, there is a lot of manipulation, and access to information is not that easy. I mean, if you do not have the information, you cannot 
generate debate around it. If you still have just one source of information, that will probably narrow your view to just repeating what they are dictating uh, from above. And Emna, do you think uh, some new structure is needed, perhaps some new laws to try and control ownership of the, of the media? Um, not specifically laws, because in terms of laws, I think we're, we're good, pretty much good. Um, but we need a new mindset. We need to change a real revolution in the culture. Um, we're trying to operate in the same, as it was mentioned in the report, like the same bureaucracy, mismanagement of the spaces. This is uh, the burden for public media and as well as the private media, how they can sustain themselves without depending on the big money. And this is a huge thing to think about. If we go back to the elections in 2019, we were so afraid that people who owned media owned the basically the public opinion and manipulated the public opinion uh, and it's not only a Tunisian way um, and here it goes also to social media how to regulate here yes we need a law not to regulate social media as it is but to counter misinformation and just to sum up this first half of the program Emna I mean uh, Tunisia is kind of held up isn't it as this model country coming out of the Arab Spring do you think Tunisia deserves that uh, accolade Absolutely. I am being biased because I am Tunisian, but also if we see where Tunisia is standing, the years of history, um, everything we went through as a nation, um, from the Carthaginians, Phoenicians, Roman, everyone built this country and left heritage. Um, we have a very good standing. This is why we did not collapse like other countries. Um, we have good standing in terms of Islam um, that we need to apply and to be very vigilant and not use it and politicize it. Um, yes, we are standing good. Uh, yes, the fight is so strong, um, but I am so hopeful. OK, well, thanks very much for being with us for this first half of the programme to my guests. Uh, stay with us here on France 24. We're going to move on to talk about other issues, look at some of uh, Nidal's cartoons very shortly as well on the programme. We'll be back right after the news. Well, welcome back to this wonderful site here at Carthage in Tunisia. In the second half of this program, in conjunction with UNESCO, we're going to continue to uh, discuss freedom of expression and uh, freedom of the press. In the first half, we uh, met our three guests. Thanks very much for being with us on the program today. Uh, and one of our guests is uh, uh, Nidal Giriani. He's a cartoonist, and we're going to look at some of his cartoons now. Uh, Nidal, let's uh, pull up the first one. Um, it kind of speaks for itself, this one, doesn't it? The freedom of speech bubble being eaten, if you like. I mean, why did you decide this was something you wanted to draw? I mean, the first we discovered the freedom of uh, speech. I mean, we started all talking at the same time. Unfortunately, I mean, judging others' idea, judging others' opinion, judging, just being judgmental, without having, like, I mean, an argument behind, is uh, developing certain hatred speech in the same time. This is what we've been through uh, after the 2011, and uh, this is something that we need to keep working on it. I mean, if you are not allowed to express yourself correctly and you feel like attacked around, you won't be able to express your ideas and you will be censoring yourself. The second one is uh, more about access to information, isn't it? Uh, tell us why you wanted to draw this. I mean, because, I mean, previously we said, like, I mean, not having the source of information open to everyone, access to information open to everyone, around will narrow our view. So that's the idea. And uh, unfortunately, there is a lot of obstacles right now. We are still inheriting certain bureaucracy, certain uh, laws are still from the uh, old ages and not yet updated to allow the, the access to information. And Rambab, something that's uh, something that you're obviously uh, fully involved in as a journalist. Uh, you, you can sympathise with that cartoon, the, the, the minds around the access to information. Yes, exactly. It really reflects the real reality today. Unfortunately, we are facing these difficulties, access to information. We have the laws. I think the problem in Tunisia is, is that there's a big difference be between the theory and the practice. We have the laws that guarantee the access to the information, but in practice, nothing is really done. We have so much difficulties to get information, to access to, uh, to information. So I think the, the second cartoon especially really reflects the reality today in Tunisia. 
This third one's a little um, sombre for, for yes. journalists, in fact. Uh, I mean, uh, Nidel, the, did you draw this one? When did you draw this one? At what period uh, it, over the last 10 years? I mean, uh, we lost two of our journalists uh, investigating uh, reports back in Libya, I mean, for a few years. Until now, we don't have a real answer about their situation. We know that uh, they have probably passed away, but uh, their family, till now, they cannot have their day, mm. a respectful day yeah. about their sons and their, their kids, morning. their friends, mm. are still not able to do that. I mean, unfortunately, this is happening a lot. When I, when I first pulled uh, the statistics, I was, like, scared about this. And I was looking around the world. There is plenty, an area that you don't think they, they are facing this danger. Uh, the Latin America, I mean, is one of the scariest places in the world for journalism. Uh, Africa as well, Middle East, uh, Europe, Turkey. I mean, uh, nowadays in Europe and democracy, we have people killed. We have people killed doing their duty, trying to pull this information, the hidden information. So it's scaring and they hope. This year, I've seen the statistics are less, but it's a statistic. Mm -hmm. Behind those numbers, there is souls, there is people trying to get the information shared with the rest of their audience. And you picked out some other cartoons for us uh, from, from other artists as well. And why did you pick this one? Uh, Boligan, I mean, I think is like one of the amazing uh, cartoonists in the world. Uh, he's uh, originally from Colombia and living in Mexico right now. But I mean, what I really appreciate, I mean, he's always amazing in the way to express ideas. And the other thing is like, this is a cartoon accessible from everyone around. You don't need to be francophone or arabophone or uh, English speaker or not even speak, I mean, uh, any language around this world, then you'll be able to understand what's going on. And probably this is why, I mean, dictatorship uh, are scared of cartoonists and cartoons because they do not need introduction, they do not need any idea about what's happening around and you get directly the message and you're open to your interpretation. And then that's quite a, a pertinent one uh, when you think of human rights, isn't it? That cartoon? Absolutely. Cartoons are one of the most impactful um, and interesting tools to use. Uh, we've seen that throughout the revolution, I think. Nidal and other cartoonists in the country, um, they expressed our feelings, our emotions, um, our um, rage against certain things going wrong in the country, but also our happy um, vision of, yes, we are using our freedom of expression. Uh, we're using this through uh, their images. Um, and the boom on social media using their images were, um, and cartoons was very interesting. Mm. And we've seen that throughout everything. When you go everywhere, uh, from back to Palestine, to Hamdallah, to today, to tomorrow, it's a very powerful tool. You mentioned social media there. You, other guests have mentioned it as well in the past. I mean, that's something that is uh, really exploding now here in Tunisia and elsewhere, of course, uh, particularly amongst younger people. Absolutely. Social media is a, was a powerful tool in the revolution. We've been, uh, we were really um, exchanging information. Um, even with the um, surveillance and everything, we were able to, uh, to share what happened in the country in the darkest time. Um, but soon after that, I think the governments around the world um, knew how to deal with social media. It was very new to them. Um, I think other than Barack Obama using very well uh, social media for his campaign, um, they did not really used it, um, use it. And so for us, it became a tool. Uh, we thought that it's a tool for the people. Now it's also a tool for the um, authoritarian regimes, for governments all over the world. And we've seen that in democracies changing, uh, the power of using social media, um, like WhatsApp in Brazil and the elections. Facebook is a powerful tool. The government talks to the people here through Facebook. We're like seven or eight million uh, profiles out of uh, 12 million people in the country. This is huge. Um, and it leaves a big question. We're relying on a foreign um, tool, 
uh, to regulate, to share news, and to get updates on everything. Um, it's a little bit scary, um, to be honest, but also, um, are we keeping up uh, with social media uh, policies, internal policies, with our data protection, privacy, surveillance, all of that? I think we're very behind. Mm. And social media, can it be a problem, though, for, for people like yourself, Nidal Cartoonist? I mean, just thinking about uh, the situation, we're on France 24. Obviously, France has had uh, a lot of problems with, with cartoons and cartoonists and, and people being upset by them. I mean, is it something uh, that if you, if you put something in social media or some of your work is put on social media particularly, that you do get a, a lot of uh, perhaps aggression back from, from some quarters? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, we are open to discussion. We are open to criticism. I mean, we are sharing our thoughts to be criticized, mainly. We are not trying to uh, just guide people around us by sharing our ideas. Uh, however, I mean, a great point mentioned earlier is about, I mean, uh, the fake news. I mean, redirecting information in a way, just showing portion of the iceberg, this kind of stuff. I mean, and another thing is, like you mentioned, the usage of the, the social media is manipulation as well. Nowadays, unfortunately, we are going to an area called the IA era, which collecting a lot of data around the, around the world, and there are a lot of influences based on that. We need to be prepared to that. Laws are not yet ready for that. I mean, the society is not yet ready, yet ready for that. I think this will be a big change, changing period. We will take certain time before we can control, again, the freedom of speech used in social medias and preserve the liberty and freedom of everyone around this world. And Rambab, do you think that social media is a, a, a tool that is, is, is positive? As a journalist, obviously, uh, I'm sure you use it yourself and, and obviously your colleagues do, but it's also something that individual people can, can use and, and take to, to express their opinions. Exactly. As a journalist, it's, uh, let's say, an amazing tool. Uh, I can uh, publish uh, news, uh, put videos, everything, and, and uh, I think it, it, it helped me a lot as a journalist. But at the same time, fortunately, politicians today are using this tool, social media, in order to spread misinformation and uh, mislead uh, people. So uh, here, I think that um, I, I, will, I, will, uh, I will talk uh, here about the two laws, uh, revolutionary uh, uh, rules, uh, laws, that is um, 115 and 116. These two decrees are really a, a revolution for uh, the media uh, outlet. But at the same time, these two decrees uh, didn't regulate the social media. That's why we, we see this uh, type of misinformation and uh, uh, rumors everywhere, especially during the, the coronavirus uh, crisis. So, as a journalist, I, I think it's uh, an amazing tool, but at the same time, we have to keep an eye, we have to regulate social media in order to, uh, to put uh, accuracy and the correct information. Nidal mentioned fake news as well, which yes. uh, inevitably, of course, spreads largely on social media. I know that's something you, that you're very worried about too. Yes, of course. And now I'm working on a project with Business News. It's called Bay in Check. It's a platform for fact checking. We daily um, fact check rumors that are spreading on, on social media. But uh, here I would like to mention the fact that uh, today people aren't aware of uh, the, the rumors and uh, misinformation. Uh, problems. People prefer speedy information rather than uh, accuracy. So it's our role as a journalist to prove that the most important thing is uh, clear and accurate uh, information better than uh, speed uh, one. So um, I would like to hear to, to say also that in, here today in uh, the media outlet we've changed uh, maybe uh, the regime, some, uh, some political figures and everything, but we didn't change the mentalities of uh, of people. People need to change. People need to understand the importance of uh, an accurate information. Emna, it's always going to be difficult though, isn't it, to, to stop fake news? Absolutely. They are very widespread everywhere. Um, but the platforms are doing a good job. Um, I say good with a lot of like um, reserves on that. Um, there's still a lot of job to be done. Um, we've seen a lot of censorship also or um, taken down content, which sometimes uh, counters the freedom of expression. 
Um, but in other times, we really need to collaborate all together, journalists, uh, governments uh, with certain reserves also, and uh, social media platforms on that. Um, it's very important to know that um, we have few tools that we can use and that people can really uh, be careful on what they share and not spread social, um, sorry, fake news uh, and misinformation. Um, we've seen platforms like Twitter using, um, adding the label of a government uh, media, for example, um, or a government person to certain profiles, basically to distinguish um, and so people they know who they are addressing or retweeting or tweeting. Um, we've seen also uh, other platforms like YouTube adding the source and the Wikipedia article to uh, certain videos from media. This is very good, but also we should be vigilant and people should really check before resharing. Uh, because the organic way, as much as it's good um, to share, uh, as much as we should be vigilant in a world of mis- and disinformation. It's partly a technological problem. I mean, technologies have just exploded so much, isn't it? It gives people the opportunity to, to be able to, to, to publish and broadcast on their own, whether it be on social media or, or on radio or on television, and the number of channels. I mean, it's very, very difficult to control that, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean... Back in the days, if we look back uh, to the um, traditional media, we had radios and TVs. It, they were easy to control, to control the propaganda, to control what is said and the information that is spread. And it takes a lot of time for some journalists to do an investigation and come up with the truth. Now, the, whatever misinformation could go in few seconds everywhere and could change opinions. And we've seen a lot of that happening in the region as well all over the world. Um, all of the social protests happening, they started with everybody sharing, uh, which is a good thing, but also a bad thing when it's not accurate. Um, social media also was, we were able to see what happened in, uh, in the USA with um, racial protests, uh, racial justice protests. And we, we saw how global it was because of social media. If there was no social media, we were unable really to follow and to see um, that the UK joined, uh, France, other countries, as well as Tunisia also, we had protests for racial, uh, racial equity. Um, this is very important that we know the, the barrier uh, of social media, that social media is not the response to everything and that we should really rely on uh, media as a tool also. We are tending to really forget that media has a role to play and media has ethics. Social media does not have the same ethics. It's basically um, a bunch of companies in the US, in San Francisco, having all of the policies. We're running out of time. Nidal, let me just ask you, are you optimistic for the future after everything we've talked about? Of course, yeah. I mean, the most we know, we most we are scared, but we are aware about our responsibilities as well. And uh, the better we have a view of those uh, problems, the better we will be able to find solution or help finding solution, resolving them and moving forward. Uh, let's put this in its uh, context. So, I mean, this place has been built through thousands of years. They've been through rough times. They've been through moments where they lost certain hopes. But here we are. I mean, things keep going, growing, changing. And uh, man is amazing uh, in its nature by being in the same time an amazing creature that being able to, 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 to build all this, to build this freedom, this uh, quality of life. But this is not like for free. We need to fight for it. And we'll keep doing it, I think. Ralev, do you think the people of Tunisia are up to that in 30 seconds? I have confidence. Really, I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, despite la the last year, 2020, was a black year for journalists and uh, many of journalists, I, I think uh, around uh, 206 journalists were uh, attacked. But really, I'm optimistic. I have confidence in this uh, really new generation of uh, journalists and also I have confidence on Tunisian people. So I'm optimistic. Great to have that uh, positive message for the end of the programme. Thank you very much to all three of you uh, for coming in and talking to us today. Thank you as well uh, for watching amongst this beautiful sight here at Carthage in Tunisia. The very latest news coming up for you very shortly here on France 24, this special programme brought to you with UNESCO.